Welcome to Working Smarter, Concise Compliance Conversations, featuring Wendy Rubis, sponsored by Village MD, primary care physicians, practice medicine the way you always wanted, data, resources, and clinical decision support to care for your patients inside and outside the exam room. Hi, welcome to Working Smarter. I'm Wendy Rubis, General Counsel of Village MD. It's such a pleasure to be here today with Bobby Sapuka. He's Chief Administrative Officer at Cricket Health. Bobby, how are you? I'm well, thanks. Thanks so much for joining us today. I was thinking of you recently because we have some major changes to Medicare payment for kidney disease. And of course, our audience, we're working in primary care. And so we have a lot of patients that are in dealing with this at one stage or another. So thanks for joining us and helping us understand this problem. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. It's, it's really great to be here. Bobby, can you tell us a little bit about the prevalence and the scope of this problem? Absolutely. It's an enormous problem. And unfortunately, it's something that a lot of people just don't know about. It's the ninth leading cause of death in the U.S. It impacts almost 40 million Americans. And it's a progressive disease. So over the course of the stages, stages one through five, the kidney function degrades over time to the point where at kidney failure, you move into end stage renal disease, uh, meaning you have unfortunately very few options, which are dialysis, conservative therapy, which is palliative care, which means you die, or you get a transplant. There are seven hundred a little over 700,000 people with end-stage renal disease. 600,000 of these folks are on dialysis, and it's not an easy life. These are very sick folks. It's very complex. Once one organ system fails, others tend to follow. So it's, a, it's certainly a hard life, and they're a complex set of patients to deal with. Um, there are about 100,000 Americans who begin dialysis each year. Unfortunately, the mortality rate for the first year is about 40% if you annualize the, the incident rate. And then it, thereafter, if you survive that onset dialysis, then you can expect to live about five years. It's shocking. So again, it, it's so shocking. Is that because the body just can't handle dialysis because it's so invasive? That's part of it. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of it is that people, too many people don't know they have it. So literally yeah. over 60% of patients will show up at an ER you know, on a Friday and say, I don't feel very good. And the ER doc will run tests and say, well, that's because your kidneys have failed. And these are people who didn't even know they had kidney disease. And so they get a catheter plunked in their chest and they're told that, you know, you're going to be on dialysis today yeah. and for the rest of your life. So Medicare in 1972 began to provide coverage. Is this maybe one of the only areas where your disease alone is enough to qualify you for Medicare if you have end-stage renal disease? That's correct. It was the first disease state. I think ALS is now one as well. Okay. Unfortunately, there's no treatment for ALS, so the spend there is is next to zero. But yeah, today and since 1972, people give the government an awful lot of grief these days for not doing anything. What happened in 1972 was a miracle. This was a new therapy that not a lot of people had access to. And if they did, could have access to it. It was just far too expensive. And so government stepped in and said, listen, if you're five or 65, once your kidneys have failed, you're going to be eligible for Medicare. And it was an absolute lifesaver. Because it's either, at for, that point, it was either that or you're going to die. Correct. That, that was it. And there were literal death panels across the country where you had members of clergy and prominent people in the, in the community uh, who would sit down on a monthly basis in a dark room somewhere and, and decide, I have two patients, this person gets dialysis, this person doesn't. Uh, it was a horrible yeah. state of affairs in the 60s and 70s. So the challenge today is that nobody in 1972 could have ever expected the explosion of both the incident rate of kidney failure and the cost of care. It has exploded to a point today where we spend $40 billion on, on ESRD as a, it's just the Medicare program alone. Yes. And then what ends up being the conundrum or the absurdity is if you're stage four or stage five and you didn't otherwise qualify for Medicare, there's no treatment. So you almost have to wait all the way until you're in full ESRD to get care. That's exactly right. You know, the, the perverse incentive that resulted from a wonderful program and a wonderful initiative in 1972 is that all of the money goes to dialysis. And so you've had large organizations evolved over time that have run um, dialysis clinics across the country. There are about 6,000 clinics now across the country that bill on a fee-for-service basis and, you know, build an awful lot of uh, money both to the government and to private payers over time. It's the challenge that we have with payment policy. It ends up having these unintended consequences. And I think it's something that people working in healthcare have known for a long time. And so I think it was a good day just this past July when I learned that our president had a new executive order. I'm sure you guys at Cricket Health have followed this closely. For our listeners, an executive order 
is something that a president issues, and it usually either comes along with or ends up causing regulatory activity. And so in this case, I think there was a fair amount of programmatic regulations and so on announced either on the same day or shortly thereafter. So Bobby, can you tell us a little bit about what to think about this executive order and the programs that followed? The order that was announced in July is a massive step forward, and the you know CMS and the federal government needs to be applauded. As you said, people have known for decades that we have this problem, that there hasn't been focus on, on CKD, but no one's sort of understood how to attack it. It's just been too hard a problem. And there have been a couple of changes in the last few years that have made, sort of set the groundwork to make this executive order possible. The biggest of which is just the evolution of value-based care. Right. Public and private payers are now realizing that it makes sense. It behooves us to spend a few dollars today in the hopes of saving a lot more dollars in the future. The key part, and this is where the administration deserves an awful lot of credit, is that they're not focusing just on the dialysis population. They announced a combination of three programs, the vast majority of which is focused on late-stage CKD. So really trying to help providers, both physicians and dialysis providers and organ transplant centers to take more accountability for late stage CKD patients, both in terms of cost and in terms of clinical outcomes. So we start to manage this population, start to get them ready for dialysis, hopefully get them ready for transplant, which is the best possible outcome for them, and start making in-center dialysis the treatment of last resort. So I think, you know, just from looking at the order, one of the things that I noticed was these are basically outcome goals. People that aren't watching, I'll tell you what the goals were. A reduction of new ESRD cases by 25% in 10 years. Increase the percentage of ESRD patients who are getting dialysis at home or a a transplant to 80%, which from what you're telling us, Bobby, that's a major jump. And then double the kidneys available for transplant by 2030. So are these aggressive goals? Are these, is this a moonshot? These are absolutely moonshot. And again, I am of the camp that we ought to be in some ways naive and just go for big audacious goals. And so I applaud them. I don't think we should necessarily beat ourselves up if we fall short. You know, let's strive to make major change because the one thing that this whole industry and this whole segment of healthcare has suffered from is, frankly, low expectations. Right. People have just so said, this is all, you know, this is all that, that renal patients are entitled to get. It was such a breakthrough, okay. right? It was this huge yeah. breakthrough, and then it's stuck. Now we're stalled. Correct. Yeah. So, you know, the national average of patients who are being treated at home for dialysis is a paltry 12%. And there's 100,000 Americans on the transplant waiting list today. So to suggest that by 2025, 80% of new patients are going to be treated at home or get a transplant is aggressive in the extreme. Now, Bobby, tell me about this home dialysis. Because I always thought of dialysis as, in my experience, you go into a center and it's like three times a week and you're there a long time, I think. There are two kinds of dialysis and at the risk of getting your audience in the weeds, there is home hemodialysis. So there are machines you can put in your home that do the exact same thing at home. The challenge with that is that it takes you know, space at your home. These are not small machines. Many require pure water. Not a lot of us have pure purified water in the home. It requires a caregiver to, often to actually put the needle in your arm. I mean, or Bobby, we're talking about I can't keep my computer going at home, okay? I will throw away a toaster. I don't know about keeping a home dialysis. That, to me, the hemodialysis machine option just feels so hard. I don't know. So the other kind of dialysis you can perform is peritoneal dialysis. And that's where actually saline goes through your body and you use the lining of your gut, the peritoneum, to be the filter, to filter out the toxins and to help clean your blood. That is a slower dialysis and actually can be done more frequently. So PD or peritoneal dialysis is an interesting option for a lot of folks. But the challenge, as I said, is that only 12% of total patients right now dialyze at home, either PD or home hemo. The vast majority, by the way, of that 12%, I think on the order of 90% or so, use PD, the peritoneal dialysis. I see. This is going to force innovation and new care models and new treatments and things to get people dialyzing at home. That is certainly the hope. So there's three programs, as I think you mentioned. And the first is a mandatory program that's going into effect in January. And that's going to basically split the country in half, and they're going to do it by sort of local regions so that half of patients who are on dialysis are in the existing program and half are in the new program. And what the new program means is that both nephrologists and dialysis providers, the actual clinics, um, will either get more money or are susceptible to losing money if two things happen. One, if they increase their home penetration rate, meaning they have more patients treated at home, and they increase transplant rate, then they can get more money. 
if they fall below others in their region, then they can lose money. So there's some winners and some losers. So that's what's going into effect in January. And that's a mandatory model that I think the final rule is due in November and it's supposed to go into effect January 1. It doesn't impact chronic kidney disease. It only impacts the patients who are on dialysis Got today. It. So then there are two other programs. And unfortunately about these programs, we don't have a lot of details. They're, They're aspirational at this point. Yeah, they were announced. They're voluntary programs. They're supposed to go into effect in January as well, um, which is interesting because no one has any details. Got it. Okay. But the general point is that each of these three programs, Bobby, will involve a way a nephrologist delivers care. In other words, these are not programs a primary care physician would participate in. Providers of all stripes can come together with dialysis providers or organizations like Cricket who are trying new models or hospitals or transplant centers they can come together and they can form these new entities, which I think you can effectively look at like a lot like ACOs. Right, right. And take more responsibility for CKD patients. And so it's an ACO for late stage CKD. And they'll be tracked on a variety of measures. Again, two of the biggest are going to be home dialysis rates and transplant rates. But the better you care for your patients, the more you can lower costs, the better off you'll do economically. So I think that's going to really, yeah. really drive improvements in care because then suddenly those tens of millions of Americans with chronic kidney disease will suddenly go from unmanaged to managed. And if that's the case, then I think we're going to see some really dramatic improvements in care. That's very cool. So tell us a little bit about Cricket and how Cricket is engaging in this space. Well, I think a lot of it goes back to the point you made several minutes ago, which is the right one, which is because of perverse incentives, albeit well-meaning, the perverse incentives have led all of the money to flow to patients only after their kidneys have failed. And Cricket started with the fundamental premise of, gee, wouldn't it make a heck of a lot more sense to start engaging with patients before their kidneys have failed, not after? So we work with payers and health systems to identify patients with late-stage kidney disease, mostly stages four and five, meaning you're probably 18 to 24 months away from kidney failure. We identify those patients, we enroll them in our program, and we assign a nurse, a dietitian, a social worker, a pharmacist, and a patient peer mentor over this platform through which the patients can communicate with their team, you know, synchronously, asynchronously, talk, text, video, you name it. And so we can then help manage them towards their progression into dialysis. And what we found is, you know, we're still small, we're still a startup, we don't have many patients under management, but those we do, we have 45% of our patients start dialysis at home wow. compared to 12% of the national average. So if we can continue to outpace the national average by four times, we think we can dramatically improve care. Yeah, got it. So Cricket is all about working with patients. Is it only ESRD patients or is it also those kidney chronic kidney disease patients who are pre-ESRD? It is definitely pre-ESRD. That's where we need to start because if we start too late, then we're not going to make any improvements. But it's, it's a great point because we do not stop once their kidneys fail and they move into ESRD. We are opening home programs so that we can help them dialyze at home and we continue to manage their care so that you know, they understand where, what's going on so they can ask their peer mentor, ask their nurse, have that same team helping them all throughout the continuum of their disease. Well, it sounds very much like Village MD for dialysis patients. So I think Cricket and Village MD were both thinking alike in terms of, you know, just going back to how can we deliver the best care using an extended care team, technology, innovation, et cetera. So it's such a great time to be in healthcare and such a great time for new ideas to break through, don't you think? I absolutely agree. It's a wonderful time to be part of healthcare because I think finally we're trying to you know, bring the silos down. Yes. Great. Well, Bobby, thank you so much for joining us today. It's such a pleasure to have you. And I hope you'll come back and give us more information about how this is going and how this law is evolving. I would love to. Thanks again for having me. Okay. Thanks. Remember to keep working smarter. Thanks for listening. And we hope that you join back for future episodes. Something new. We're now on Spotify, Stitcher, or anywhere you get your podcasts. Also, please see the description below for a link to give us feedback, receive materials of things that we reference in the podcast, or if you want to be a guest on Working Smarter. We love hearing your comments, so please leave any and all feedback that you have for us. Thank you to our sponsor, Village MD. We hope you will join us for future concise compliance conversations.